Good day and welcome again at Rhythm Church. Uh, my name is Andres and it's so good that uh, you are looking or streaming or connecting with us again today through Facebook, YouTube, whatever, to be part of, of our church and the sermons we are doing. Now, I'm going to do a talk today about storms because I think a lot of people experience the whole corona, the COVID-19 Thing as a big storm, uh, a storm hitting them from out nowhere. Uh, it wasn't planned, you couldn't really schedule things, plan things ahead, and all of a sudden you're in the midst of this storm. It's a, it's a physical storm for a lot of people, illness, uh, working late night, uh, fear. It's a storm of financial uh, impact on the world, not just in America, I think all over the world. All of a sudden, we are living in a brand new era of, of, of how it is. And this is a storm for a lot of people. Uh, the, the numbers that are going ar about, the amount of people losing their jobs, uh, the financial support that the government and everybody needs to give one another and stuff like that. So I think we are in this big, massive storm and I want to talk to you how to go through a storm uh, I've been through storms in my life really terrible storms thinking believing I'm gonna lose everything and how did I get through it I'm not the only one I mean the Bible it's so full of storm stories eh? and maybe in some of your storms because I believe everybody goes through storms every now and then Maybe in your own storm stories, you learn some things, how to get through it. Uh, I think a big thing for me in any storm is, and this will also pass. Hey? Um, this is not uh, uh, eternal. It's not permanent. Any storm has got a, a date that it stops and that you need to learn how to rebuild your life. So the Bible is full of storm stories and we could go into them. Um, I mean, I, let's start. Maybe the first one is Noah. It was 40 days, the rain, day and night, and the boat lifting up. And then another, I can't remember exactly, 100, 120, something like that, days before he could send out the birds, the, the crow and the dove and the, the ark coming to an end. So it was a long time that they've been, you know, housebound, locked in, social distance. He was staying with animals. Can you imagine the smell in that place? I mean, some of you thinking the smell in your house is bad, but can you imagine the smell in Noah's Ark? So that was a big storm story. Another storm story is maybe Jonah. Jonah and the big fish. Do you remember that one? He was supposed to go to Nineveh, and all of a sudden he wanted to go to Tarsus, and the storm on the boat, and they threw the lots and said, who must get off, and Jonah must get off, and they throw him overboard. Big storm story in the Bible, impressive storm story. Um, the disciples, I think the New Testament's got some of the best storm stories. One of my own favorite was where Jesus was asleep in the boat, um, and the disciples uh, were afraid for their lives. Now, that what made that story beautiful for me is, the storm couldn't wake Jesus. Just think about that. It is the lightning, maybe, the thunder, it's rain, it's wind, it's stormy, it's people crying, shouting, and stuff going on. And Jesus was asleep. Amazing. What woke Jesus was the prayers of his disciples. And, and let me tell you this straight away, I could preach on this thing. What about the storm, COVID-19, is is making no sound waves in heaven, but your prayers is making the sound waves in heaven. I mean, Jesus didn't listen to the storm. He listened to when his disciples asked him to come and help. He's not afraid of a storm, but he loves his disciples. So, so get that. He's hearing you. He knows what you are feeling and saying in the midst of a storm. Other storm maybe is when Jesus walked on the water. I mean, that was a storm, and all of a sudden they thought it's a ghost. He was there. Peter got out of the boat himself, walked towards Jesus. Amazing storm story. I want to go to almost the last storm story that we've got, and that is the one of Paul. Yes, Paul was um, taken into custody, 
and then they send him or they wanted to to uh, release him but other guys wanted to kill him and he said because you guys are detaining me without good reason I, I put my trust in Caesar and I want to put my case in front of Caesar in Rome. So all of a sudden, Paul needs to get to Rome. So they said, all right, let's send him on a boat to Rome. And they ended up at the place called Fair Havens. Now, I don't know about you, but Fair Havens sounds like a nice place. It's quite fair. It is quite easy. It doesn't sound noisy to me. It, it sounds safe to me. And Paul says to them, it's not safe to travel any further now. We must stop at fair havens. But the people didn't listen to him. The, the owner of the ship and the commander of the army and they say in the scripture, the multitudes agreed that let's go further with this journey towards Rome. And then they end up in a storm. In, a, in one of the biggest storms that's been explained in the, ba in, in the Bible, if you go to the Greek word they use for this storm, it is like a catastrophic storm, a life-threatening, killing, a seismo storm. The word they use to, to determine the size of an earthquake, a seismometer, it's the seismo storm uh, hitting Paul and the boat. So let's go to that story. That story is in Acts 27. And we're going to do quite a bit of reading because Paul is going to show us, teach us how to go through a storm, how to survive a storm, maybe even more, how to thrive in stormy weathers, how to get through it full of faith, full of courage, and with a testimony to live forward. So let's read Acts 27 from verse 14. It says, Before very long, a wind of hurricane force. This is what the NIV translation uses. A wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the, uh, from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not heat into wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. We jump to verse 18. We, to we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. We, with, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. This kind of storm is maybe a storm that a lot of people are experiencing right now. They gave up all hope of being saved. Uh, they don't know about the future, future of their kids, future of the family, future work, future finance, maybe sickness or illness, stuff like that. They don't know the future. And it is this size of storm that, that is threatening my life, your life, family's life. And we're asking, how do I go about to get through this size storm? They threw stuff overboard with their own hands, saying, we don't have hope. Nobody else is telling us anything. We don't have hope. I know the situation. We're not going to make it. We're throwing stuff overboard with our own hands because we've given up all hope of being saved. I, I, I'm just praying that if you are there, that this message will help you. If you are asking questions, if you are not sure, if your faith is taking some, some battering at the moment, you, you may be feeling you are on this boat, house bound, boat bound, and you need to get out and get your life going again, but you're on this boat and, and you don't know how and when and what you're going to do, this sermon can really, really help you. So let's go forward. Um, how did they go about working through this? The next thing that's happening is very important. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because none, not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong 
and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given uh, you the lives of all the men sailing with you. So, keep your courage up, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as He told me. So this is the, the, the starting point of how you get through it. Paul starts with, I told you so. Now that's not a good way to go through a storm. And what I mean by that is we always like to accuse somebody of why I am going through what I'm going through. You can say, this wasn't my decision. It was the government's decision to shut down everything. Or you could say, it wasn't my, it was my boss's decision or whatever. You could always blame someone. Now, now Paul starts like that and he says, now I could blame you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rather talk about courage and how we're going to get through this so that no one's life will be lost. So th this caught my attention because I know myself, I like to blame people. But sometimes, I must be honest with you, um, the reason I'm in some storms <laughs> was sometimes my own fault. And maybe you feel like that. You say, yes, that's true. I'm in this storm because maybe I made some debt that wasn't necessary and now all of a sudden with the job loss or financial loss or taking a cut on my salary or whatever, now all of a sudden we're in this trouble. If I didn't make that debt, we should have been fine or would have been fine. But now it's my, it's my mistake that draw my whole, whole family into the storm. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, I've done stupid stuff. You've done stupid. I, I took my whole family through storms in my life. And then the guilt, the guilt paralyzes me. When, when I'm feeling guilty and I feel ashamed, I, I, I can't do anything. I'm just like, oh, this is the storm. And, and I don't have hope and I don't know what to do. And I don't have courage and I don't have strength or power or, or the ability or the willingness to work through the storm. So I'm just giving up and it was my own mistake so guilt can paralyze you shame can paralyze you or blame can paralyze you if you feel i'm in this storm and it's somebody else else's mistake and now i'm in this storm and and i don't know what to do and uh, it wasn't my fault and it's not fair what's happening to me and it's not fair what the government said and it's not fair it's not fair it will paralyze you so that you won't take up courage and won't take up the promises of God of what He said about your life, of, of what He said you can be and who you will be and where will you end and all the stories. So be careful. Um, it doesn't matter. And I'm honest with this. It doesn't matter who created the storm. It doesn't matter who said we're going to sell. The multitudes, the uh, Paul was the only one saying we need to stay. And he could play the blaming game till the end and say, only I will be saved. All of you will die. And I mean, he could play that game. But he's teaching us the first principle of a storm. And that's the word forgiveness. Forgive yourself for your mistakes. I mean, if, if you created this storm or created other storms in your life, you created financial storm, you created relational storms, you created whatever kind of, hey, forgive yourself. Do you know why? Because guilt and shame will paralyze you. And then forgive others. I mean, Jesus is our example. He's hanging on the cross. He's going through a storm on the cross. All hell is breaking loose on top of him. He's taking up all our sins. He's taking up the guilt of the world on top of him. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. I mean, that's the principle, the first, the, the most basic principle of getting through a storm. Forgiveness. Forgive yourself and forgive others. Forgive the government, forgive the governor, forgive the president in which country you, you stay, wherever you live, whatever. Just forgive. Because when you start forgiving, you start to get power. You start to take control back and say, 
I'm going to do what God is saying. I don't give power away. I take power and say, I'm going to take control of my situation, my attitude, my carriage and all of that. The second thing that Paul did is, he went back to a promise God gave him in Acts 25. In Acts 25, when they wanted to kill him and wanted to throw him in jail or whatever they wanted to do with him, and some say he can go through and others say, no, they want to stone him and kill him and do all of this. He said, I need to speak to the Caesar. So in Acts 25, he had that promise. He will go to Rome. He will see the believers in Rome and he will testify before the Caesar and the Caesar gods. He got that promise. And now God came to him and says, do you remember the promise? Do you remember who you are, what I've said, what the promises are I gave you? And all of a sudden in that night when the angel appeared to him, it, it, it renewed his strength, his faith, his courage to know, oh yes, God promised me I'm going to go to Caesar. I'm going to go to Rome. So he was standing on previous promises. Now, I know, when you're in a storm, it's so easy to forget those promises. Eh? When you're in a storm, you think, oh, I didn't read my Bible correctly, or I, I didn't listen nicely, or maybe God didn't mean it that way. I mean, I know when I go through a storm, the old promises, they are down in the dust, in the ground, and I'm, oh, I can't believe it. But maybe you are saying, if an angel appears to me, hey, I, I was saying that, I was praying through this scripture, and I'm, and I'm praying, oh Lord, it would be so nice if you just appeared to me, just, just an angel one eye in my dreams coming and say, I sent you to America, you need to do a work, I've got a calling for you, and we've got a plan, and we're going to do mission work back to Africa, South Africa, and I've got this whole plan for you. And, and, and I'm lying there and thinking, if it's just an angel talking to me. And then the Lord said to me, the word angel the, Lord, uh, the, the word angel in Hebrew back in the Old Testament, do you know what it means? It only means messenger. And the Lord said, well, I've given you many messengers. I mean, all the sermons you're listening to, all the other pastors you listen to every week, they're giving you messages just like that angel. And, and all the songs you listen to and all the books you're reading, it's all messengers telling you who you are and who you're supposed to be and wh what's the promises God gave you. So to go back to all the messengers that gave you the message. And still you say, yo, but I, really, yes, I would like it if it's just an angel. Can I, can I be honest with you? Be careful because the Bible says even the devil can appear as an angel of light. So, so what I'm saying to you is, you always need to discern the promises and the voices and the scriptures you get. So even if it's an angel speaking to you, you need to discern. Even when it's me preaching to you, you need to discern. Any other pastor preaching to you, any scripture, any song, anything you think is maybe God saying something to you, you need to discern it. And quickly, it's not a lesson about knowing the voice of God, but discernment has to do with you go back to the character of God. The thing I just heard, is it good? Does it come from a good, good father? Is it love? Yes. Is it challenging? Is it faith? Is it taking up courage? I mean, the words God's given us is never easy. It's not comfortable. It's not uh, um, all about me. The words God gives me is always about other people. It's, it's words that's stretching me, that's growing me. So you need to discern whatever word promise you are holding on to. If it's all about you, be careful. L listen to Paul's words. Nobody on the boat will be lost. Yes, the boat will be destroyed. The ship will be destroyed. So financially it won't be good, but lives will be saved. So discernment's about go back to the character of God. Is it love? Is it faith? Is it patience? Is it growing stuff in you? Is it something about the suffering of Christ, being one with Him, being called, being sent? That's all the character of God that you can discern in when God is speaking to you. But the big thing is, hold on. Hold on to the promises. So Paul is standing up and saying, come on guys, I've got promises from God. And he's saying, and I'm believing, it will end just like he said it will end. And he's holding on. Forgiveness 
and holding on to the promises is the first two things you need to do. Let's go further. Um, in verse 30, it says the following. And then, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors for the bulb. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboats and let it drift away. <laughs> Firstly, that doesn't sound too clever to me. Never cut the rope of the lifeboat. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that wasn't very clever. But there's a principle in this. And the principle is very easy to catch. Let, let's first talk about letting the lifeboat go. Your lifeboat, what, uh, what's coming to mind when you think about a lifeboat? For me, the first thing that comes to my mind is I've got a lifeboat in my savings account. As long as I've got the lifeboat, uh, I don't feel too much afraid of what's going on. Because I've got the lifeboat. I've got money put away, savings put away for a rainy day or a stormy day. And what he did here is they cut the lifeboat, the ropes to the lifeboat. So they're saying the following, our trust and our hope is not in the lifeboat, but in the God that Paul is serving. That's a gutsy thing to do. I don't know about you. So maybe it's not as much, you know, take all of your money out of your savings account and give it to the church. Good thing to do, maybe. I don't know. But it's more where, where does your trust uh, lies? That's what it's asking. Is it in the lifeboat? Is it you think you'll be okay through COVID-19 because of your lifeboat? because of your savings, because of your money. And if your trust is in your money, it can disappear in seconds. Uh, I mean, if you told me in the beginning of March, by the end of April, there will be 22 million people without work in America, I would have laughed at you. <laughs> if you told me in the beginning of March, government, huge billion trillion dollar governments will all decide to shut down the economy um, i mean in africa in europe all over the world people governments presidents are deciding to shut down governments i would have laughed at you and say they love their money too much they love their economies too much they will never do it it will be world war three before it starts blah 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 and it happened within 40, 50 days. So if your trust is in money, if your trust is in a lifeboat, you are in a very dangerous place. And then Paul says, th this is the principle. If you leave the ship, you won't be protected. This is the principle. If you leave the gathering of the saints, if you leave the right people in your life, if you, if you go on your own and you think, I don't need anybody, I don't need Paul. I don't need the church. I don't need anybody saving, helping me. If you jump off the ship, you can't be saved. That's what he's saying. If you go on your own and you trust your lifeboat and you're not part of church and you don't give to church and you're not part of the family of Christ, the right people, your small group, you will pay the price. That's what Paul's saying. You can't be one of the ones that's going to be saved. So easy principle. Don't leave the church. Don't leave the online services. Don't, don't leave in a time like this. Think, oh, nobody sees me. The pastor doesn't see me. Nobody knows what I'm doing. I'm going to use my money for myself. Don't do the stupid thing, according to Paul. All right, the next principle, almost at the end. Verse 33, it says, Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. I know that's not true for us in this corona time, eh? I mean, the only thing we've been doing is actually eating the whole time. In the morning, in the afternoon, at night, walking past that fridge. You can't leave the stuff alone. You're housebound and you eat, 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 eat. Okay, their story is different. They didn't eat. Um, he said, you haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from its head. 
words he picked up from Jesus, eh? even the hair on your head are counted. He says, after he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. In short, you say, what does this mean? It's not so much about the physical food. It's about the spiritual food. Um, how, how's your eating been? <laughs> eating of the word. Uh, I can be honest with you. I, I enjoy some of the COVID, the coronavirus epidemic. What I enjoy the most is all the time I can spend in the word. I read a chunk of word in the morning, early mornings. And then sometimes in the afternoon, I will grab my Bible again and just enjoy the Word. And sometime late at night, we just read another few scriptures or, or chapters. So we've got time. I mean, you're spending less time in traffic. Uh, we can go on and on and on. You've got more time to spend in the Word, to pick up on all the promises, to encourage your faith, to make you strong, to go through the storm. So forgive people. That's a big principle. Um, stay with the right crowd. Big principle in, the, in, in, in this. Uh, don't trust in your money. Another big principle. Stay in the promises God gave you. Is one of the big principles. Stay in the word. Eat the word in your life. All right. Almost at the end. At verse 39. Listen to what happens. When daylight came. They did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them uh, in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoist the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But, I don't like it when there's a but, okay? But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. Uh, the bow stuck fast and would not move. And the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. So many times, just when you think, we threw it. The morning has arrived. Everything is gone. There would come a second blow. There's a but in the story. And maybe you in that but story right now, it's like I've held on and I've got courage and faith and I tried my best. But now this, when this happens, it's just part of the story. They got through it. They, they got to the other side. And I've learned um, the blows of life doesn't come just by ones or twos. There are many times three and four blows hitting one after another. And you need to stay focused. Don't lose faith when there's a but in the story keep your faith god promises he will take you through this let's let's end the story so the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners remember paul was a prisoner to prevent any of them from swimming away and escape but the centurion wanted to spare paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan god is in control don't be afraid. He promised Paul this. So the centurion said, no killing of any of the prisoners. God will do miraculous things to keep his word, to keep you safe, to get you through the storm. And then at the end, he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship in this way. Everyone reached land safely, in safely. So at the end, they needed to help one another. Those who could swim, jump in first, start to swim to the land. The rest get on on planks and wood and whatever. And the rest, all of them together. This is a big principle, actually, uh, in being on a ship and being shipwrecked and all of that. And in life, help one another. You never get to shore alone. Make sure you take people with you in safety. Make sure to build loyalty with people, to build friendship. Use your resources and your skills and your abilities to take as many people as you can to safety on the other side. We need to stop. Let, let me tell you the end of the story. So they got there. The island is called Malta. Paul is making a fire. A snake bites him. And he just shook off the snake in the fire. Everybody think. 
oh, the God doesn't like this man. I mean, even if he survived the sea, the snake will kill him. And then they saw all of a sudden, he's not getting swollen up, he's not getting sick. And then they changed their mind. He's not hated by the gods, but he is a god. And they had an amazing time on this island. So much so, Paul went and he went and prayed for the senior guy's father. And he got healed. They brought the sick. He ministered to about everybody on the island about Jesus. They gave them a new ship. And they left after the winter all the way to Rome. And coming in in Rome, Paul had a great time. Let me tell you, after a storm, there will come a great time again in your life. There will come a time of good ministry, of testimony, of fellowship, of love. Let, let me read to you the last two verses of Acts, the book of Acts. Acts 28, 30, it says, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. How does this story end? Great, hey? Amen. So in this house arrest, he wrote some of the New Testament books we know of. Uh, the book of the, uh, to the Philippians was one of them where he says, Rejoice, I repeat, rejoice in the Lord. And he knows, let all of your needs be known through prayer and, uh, and asking and, and thanksgiving. And the Lord will provide. So he was writing some of the best stuff after the storm. The best is yet to come for you in your situation. If you need to get and work through this storm, take these principles. Forgive who you need to forgive. Stay with the promises of God. Stay with your church. Stay with the right people. Get the right word in your heart. Um, cut the lifeboat, the trust in the lifeboat. Uh, don't hope in, in, in people and stuff and uh, promises of this earth. Put your trust in God and He will take you through the storm. And He will take you to Malta. And from Malta He will take you to Rome. And your promises will come true if you put your trust in Him, if you put your faith in Him. So, I don't know what your storm, I don't know exactly how this corona thing hit you, hit your family, people around you. I don't know. Maybe you must share this sermon with someone else. Someone else lost their job. Someone else uh, are afraid of the future, not sure of an income. Maybe you need to share this. Then you share this sermon because this is the promise. Take people with you to the shore not one will be lost only the ship yeah maybe your company will not survive maybe exterior uh, things uh, will not temporarily things will not survive but you will be safe you will be stronger you will stay like paul in rome and be a witness full of boldness and without hindrance that's the promise so we can get through the storm if we trust in God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who set the pace of getting through storms. <laughs> he was facing the cross with joy. He was putting his hope on you, not on people or anything or anybody else. He just stood in the promises that you won't let his body stay in the grave. He put his faith in you in the resurrection and we saw it last weekend and we proclaim it. And now we're talking about my own storm and you calling me to stand firm, be courageous. And Heavenly Father, I come to you and say, yes, I'm afraid. Yes, uh, th there are stuff happening all around me and job loss and financial stress. And yes, I'm afraid. But today I'm taking up courage. I'm eating the word. I'm listening to the messenger you've sent me to say, we will get through this storm. Heavenly Father, thank you. I pray now that you will pick people up, make them strong, give them courage, feed them the word so that they will get through this. And one day they will testify and talk with boldness, without hindrance, about what you have done for them. I bless them today and I pray for people all over the world in the name of Jesus to stand up and get through this storm with the power and the courage of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
please share this message with your friends, family, people going through a tough time. We would love to pray with them, love to help them. In Jesus' name, all the best. See you again. God bless.